Good evening, uh, and welcome to the power shift debate. <laughs> Sounds a bit like something that uh, Jeremy Clarkson, Clarkson should be involved in, but uh, he's not. He could, couldn't make it. Couldn't make it. Uh, this event comes to you from LSE Ideas, as you can see up there, uh, which, as some, but probably not all of you know, is a a center for the study of international affairs, diplomacy, and grand strategy. The debate also marks the publication of the second issue of something called LSE Research, which I hope that uh, at least some of you, and I hope more than some of you, have, have not only seen but maybe picked up. Uh, I know that there were some copies outside earlier, so I hope you got, got one. Uh, you'll find a letter in there from me which asks you to please tell me what you think about it because that's very important. We want to get feedback. Uh, this is not necessarily a permanent contribution to the constellation of publications at the LSE, so uh, good things are bad. Please let me know. Uh, I mentioned uh, when, I, when I talk outside of LSE in particular, I mentioned that this is a publication of the London School of Economics and Political Science. The reason I do that is, uh, the reason I mention the full name is that a lot of people think mostly of the E uh, in LSE, of the economics, when they think of the school. And part of what this magazine is about, and part of what we're doing tonight, uh, is about pointing out that there's a breadth and depth of, of research at the school that goes uh, that includes economics, of course, but also goes well beyond it. Uh, a few little housekeeping things. First of all, this may be podcast, so uh, just keep that in mind uh, in terms of your language, faces you make, hand gestures, and so forth. That's me. Uh, That's me he's talking yeah, about. You know, <laughs> we, we've had this problem before, generally not with the audience. Um, also, uh, if, you would, if you would please uh, make sure your phones are, are off and, and your laptops are not on Facebook. Um, what we'll do is uh, we've agreed that this should be a discussion as much as anything else. And therefore, Arna and Mick will, will talk uh, fairly briefly, uh, lay out their positions, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Uh, uh, bringing in, obviously, uh, uh, as many people in the audience as possible, including perhaps some of uh, some uh, fellow academics who are here tonight. Um, I said this was a debate. It's really more of a forum. And our two speakers, who are co-directors of LSE Ideas, uh, agree on more things than they disagree. But tonight, they've agreed to stress their disagreements in the spirit of intellectual argument. Um, I'll introduce them briefly, because I, I think most of you do know who they are, but some of you will not. Uh, Michael Cox, being very formal now, Nick, is a professor of international relations at LSE and co-director of LSE Ideas. Professor Cox has written and lectured on a wide range of topics, from the rise and fall of the United States to thinking uh, or rethinking the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Michael is also the author, editor, and co-editor of more than 20 books on international relations, including most recently, US foreign policy and soft power. He's associated with two think tanks here in London, Chatham House and the Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI. Arne Westad is a professor of international history here. He's an expert on the Cold War era. Uh, he's editor of the journal Cold War History and general editor of the three volume Cambridge History of the Cold War. Uh, his recent book, I think it was 2006, of the Global Cold War, Third World, in Third World Interventions and the Making of Our Times won several awards, uh, including the very prestigious Bancroft Prize uh, out of Columbia University in New York. He's now working on a history of Chinese foreign affairs since 1750. 
So maybe, uh, uh, Barney, we'll begin with you, not necessarily that far back, but because uh, uh, I know you want to say a few words in a few minutes, but thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I won't quite go back to 1750, although I, I could if I was forced to do so by my uh, dear friend, co-director and opponent in this debate, May Cox. Uh, but I, I mostly stick to the 20th century and the end of the 20th century up to today. And my argument is very straightforward. There is power shift underway in contemporary international affairs which privileges China and the East Asian region over any other region in the world, which includes the United States. It's a long-term power shift. It's something that will not be finished uh, for another generation or so, uh, in, in my view. Uh, but it is on the way, and it's very unlikely that there will be events in international affairs that will turn this around, that will turn it in another direction. The most recent events underline this very, very strongly. The effects of the current economic crisis, to me, has one main message, that it's the rise of the broader East Asian region, and specifically of China, that will come out to be the main message of the effects of this crisis as we're seeing them today. And I think as we will see them even more clearly about five to seven years from now. The changes in the economic and financial system, for me, are at the core of what is going on. It's not the economic crisis of 2008 that has unleashed these forces. It goes much further back than that. It certainly goes back to the 1980s, early, early 1990s. And at the core of the issue is the unprecedented expansion in productive power and control of financial capital that is now directed towards China. This is the core issue that we're dealing with tonight. This is not so much about politics or about grand strategy or about what governments and indeed peoples will decide. It is about the core economic argument that's been put forward by a lot of people who want to deal with international affairs in a broad, in a broad sense. These are systemic changes that cannot easily be undone by changes in politics or indeed by changes in military strategy, although I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the continuation of what I have to say. China's economic rise has been spectacular. Um, it has been in many ways unprecedented. You have to go back to the United States in the period roughly from 1840 to 1860 to see anything similar. And even then, it was happening in a much smaller territory with a much, much smaller population than what you are seeing in China today. China has more than doubled its GDP over the past 10 years. It has gotten through the present economic crisis with some hiccups and with some effects that we still haven't quite grasped. Uh, but overall much better than anywhere else in the world. Uh, particularly with regard to the comparison with Western Europe and the comparison with the United States. And as I said earlier on, this is not based really on the crisis itself. It's based on the stakes that were there as we entered in to the 2008 economic crisis. The 2008 economic crisis is a symptom, more than a cause, of this change in power relations in economic terms that is taking place in the world. So that's my core argument with regard to China's rise. But there is another side to this, which ought not to be forgotten, and I'm sure Mick is going to touch upon this later on as well. That's the relative position of the United States within the international system. And this has been a position that has been changing for more than a generation going back into the past. Uh, something that's very often forgotten, this is where econ you know, economists come in handy, striking, is that in terms of relative economic position, relative to the rest of the world, the United States was really at its peak in the 1950s and perhaps the early 1960s. Ever since then, the relative share, both of production and in, in, in many ways, in terms of its overall uh, financial position, the United States has been in decline. It's been a modest, relative decline, but it's been a marked decline with regard to the rest of the world. Now, 
this does not necessarily, as I'll return to at the end of my remarks, uh, imply a change with regard to the leading position that the United States has had in international affairs. But it does tell us something about where the underpinnings, or rather the lack of underpinnings, of American power uh, has been for the last uh, almost, almost a generation. At the core of the American problem is a relative lack of productivity with regard to the rest of the world. And this is something that is not a recent phenomenon, it's something that has gone on over time. It could also be written down as overconsumption, rather than underproduction, depending on which angle you want to, want to emphasize. Uh, the situation as it's come out over the last decade is roughly like this. Uh, the United States is consuming much more than it's producing, and it's funding that overconsumption by borrowing from the rest of the world. This is an untenable situation. If you think about it in historical terms, it's something that cannot go on over a very long period of time. I'm not suggesting to you that there will be a crash in terms of the US position. I think it will be more of a sort of sliding decline, as I said, probably over a generation or so. But what we know historically about power shifts is that this kind of situation that we're seeing today cannot be pro prolongated forever. It's not something that can go on for a very, very long time. Since the rest of the world simply, and particularly China and East Asia, are not likely to put up with it. It would not be seen as being in their interest uh, to prolong it. Now, let me shift to the Chinese position. I'll return to the United States at the end of my remarks. In terms of foreign policy strategy, China's gaze at the moment is towards its own region. China, as I put it in a lecture I gave in Beijing in the spring, the presence of the Chinese foreign minister, Yang Yechu, doesn't have a grand strategy for how it wants to transform the world. That's not what this game is about from a Chinese point of view. It is about the region. It's about fastening China's position as the leading power within East Asia, or even larger East Asia, including Central Asia and Southeast Asia. I think China's preoccupation will remain there for most of the generation to come. But the reason why this is important is that this is by far the most dynamic region in terms of the world, world economy as such. So whoever is in a position of to control, at least to uh, influence to a very high extent, events within this region uh, will also have a very important say in terms of where the world goes in, in political and strategic affairs. So one of my messages tonight is watch the region. What's what's happening within the region and what China's uh, intentions and policies are, because they will bring some very important messages about how China is going to behave when it becomes a predominant superpower on a global level. I think quite a few years from now. And there are two options. One is confrontational with regard to US power within the region. And the other one is a slow process of trying to co-opt other countries into a Chinese-led strategy for economic development and for power projection within the, within the region itself. The outcome of this will depend as much on the United States and on some of the smaller countries within the region as it will depend on China. Uh, China obviously has its own stake in this, but it's not necessarily confrontational towards the rest of the region, not even towards the United States. I mean, Mick has made a point earlier on, which I think is a very good point, that at the moment, China's interests are best served by working in political terms on a global scale within a US-led world. And I think that's entirely right. Uh, of course, the big issue is what will happen when that is no longer the case. And in order to find out more about that, one should look at what is happening within the region itself. First and foremost, Korea, which I think is the big issue with regard to international affairs in East Asia, by far the most dangerous conflict in the global sense, in my view, that we are facing today, uh, today and one in which China has a very, very important role to play. So if you want to find out more about what happens over a long period of time, look at what's happening in China's neighborhood over the next five to seven years or so, how China will use its power there. Now, one word about power shifts in general. 
and I hear the historian in me most certainly would come out. Power shifts are of different kinds, historically, if you go back to Britain's rise in the late 16th, early 17th century. Um, they always are very unstable periods in international affairs. Uh, in terms of outcome, they're often very unclear. Think about the shift from British power to American power in the interwar period of the 20th century. It wasn't clear which direction this was going to go in. There were other uh, uh, powers, uh, militarist Japan, Nazi Germany, that saw this as an option for operating, probably out of the league, as it turned out, in terms of uh, global international current policy making. Uh, what we are seeing today, though, with regard to China, is something that I think is quite unique in the sense that China's demographic position and its centrality within a growing region pushes it forward in terms of its, uh, its international affairs. The only thing that I can see that would create a serious hiccup in terms of how China is going to behave more long term and its overall position doesn't really connect up to the broader economic and financial developments that I've already mentioned. It has to do with what is happening within China itself. What is very clear to me is that China needs a more representative government. It needs to listen more to its own people, whatever the background is, whatever the views are, in order to obtain the kind of internal legitimacy that is crucial for any world power to emerge. This was true for Britain, it was true for the United States, it will also be true for China. China is making progress on this, but it's very sl slow progress, as we've seen with the award of the recent Nobel Prize for Peace. It is still an issue. It's an international issue, but first and foremost, it's a Chinese issue, how this is going to develop over time, how the rest of the world views China, and how China will be able to project this power is to some extent connected to this. Then finally, let me return to the United States, because this is not just about China's growth and China's influence, it's also about what's happening on the US side. And here I think one needs to look at the last decade, really as a lost decade, in terms of the development of the political system within the United States itself, and first and foremost in terms of its foreign policy making. By making the war on terror the key element of American foreign policy during the Bush years, and unfortunately, also to quite some extent, during the first part of the Obama administration. In international power terms, the United States has been barking up the wrong tree. It is not preoccupied with what is really happening in broad sense within the international system. It is chasing its own demons and not doing very well in doing so. And this comes at the same time as the United States is facing a near paralysis in terms of its domestic political system, in terms of what is possible to do for the executive, in terms of the position of the Senate, which is more dysfunctional now than it's been for at least three generations. And probably also in terms of the, its ability to set priorities. And you can see that today, not so much with regard to the US-China relationship, but with regard to how the United States has been capable of handling its allies. And over the last 10 years as a whole, the story on that, different from the, what the story was during the Cold War, is that it's handled its crucial alliances very, very poorly. Now, if there is one sign of what a dominant great power should be capable of doing, it is handling its alliance network. And if there is one sign to me in the political aspect of things, of the relative decline of the United States, it is the inability, different from the 1980s, different from the 1990s, that you've seen in the early 2000s of the United States being able really to set up a leadership in terms of its own allies, not to mention on the international stage. So this is not just about China's rise, it's not just about the economic development that I've been describing, it's also about what's happening inside the United States, it's also about the inability that the United States has had for leadership over what I term the lost decade. So I'll finish with that and then leave the floor to me. Well, thank you very much. Hi. Well, first, um, a word of thanks to, uh, to Stryker for organizing this debate on an important topic. Second, a word of thanks to Arnie Westad for being so brave 
as to going before me. Um, very, well, I told you you were going to go first anyway. Um, let me begin, in a way, the kind of story I want to tell you as, as to how I arrived at what I suppose is the unpopular position, which is that I don't think a power shift is taking place, um, that it is yet to be proven, uh, and that there should be a big question mark, at least, on this, uh, on this debate uh, for this evening. And it does begin with something I wrote, and I won't be too autobiographical about this, but just bear with me. Uh, I wrote an article in 2001, which was actually called, I thought it was a rather good title, the article was rubbish, but the title was great. It was actually called, Whatever Happened to American Decline? Or The Rise and Fall of American Decline. Uh, the subtitle of which I suppose should have been, Why Didn't America Do uh, What Other Great Powers Have Always Done? Namely, Decline as had been anticipated, in fact, since the 1960s. In other words, there's been a long, long debate going back, not for five years since the Bush administration, not for 10, but actually right back to the 1960s and 1970s about the inevitability that all great powers decline by definition, because that's what great powers in the end will do. It's an historical law to use histrionic. Um, and that there were certain specific and concrete reasons why the United States specifically was beginning to experience uh, decline relative uh, or otherwise. I don't like this word relative, by the way. It's like being a little bit pregnant. Uh, relative <laughs> decline. So uh, it's an interesting way of getting out of the question, do you actually believe it is or is not in decline? But there you go. But anyway, there's been a long, long discussion uh, on this uh, about decline, which I tried to follow through in the, in the article, trying to show that uh, after the Vietnam War, on the one hand, at the end of the Bretton Woods system, on the other, there had been a series of systemic changes. It was then argued, proving that the United States was doing what other great powers had done in the past, including the British, namely. It was becoming, if you like, an ordinary country, as, uh, as uh, Richard Rosencrantz called it in an interesting book. This is in the 1970s note. And there were all sorts of books with covers with eagles, which were not flying very high. Um, and then came Ronald Reagan. But even in the Reagan years, of course, the debate about decline continued with back and forth because there was never a serious consensus on this. There were many who opposed the argument. And this concluded, in publishing terms at least, I think we know this, with the publication of Paul Kennedy's titanic scale study, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which had this interesting thesis of imperial overstretch. He published the book in 1987, two years before the fall of the Berlin Wall, three years before the first Gulf War and four years before the collapse of the USSR. So the one thing we can say about Paul, although I think the book's a great book, he was damn lucky to have published it as early as he did. Uh, three or four years later, it may not have sold quite so well. In other words, something rather odd happened. After 20 years of theorists and policymakers and many others talking about American decline, America started to do quite the opposite, or appeared to be doing quite the opposite. The Cold War signaled the end of official communism. The first Gulf War showed that the United States military power was huge and irresistible, with or without allies, and then the collapse of the USSR turned what we had been calling a bipolar world into a unipolar one. It was followed by one development after another that only confirmed US hegemony in the 1990s. Japan's financial collapse in 1990, 1991, the European Union's failure in former Yugoslavia, and then we had eight years of economic growth under Clinton, whether because or in spite of Clinton remains an open question. Um, and then, of course, an enormous military gap opening up between the United States and the rest. So by the, the year 2000, even though its percentage of spending on the military was less, its overwhelming position in the world was, 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 was irresistible. Uh, we were not living, in other words, in a world of American decline. We were living in a world of American resurgence. Another American century beckoned. That was the kind of argument that was there in 2000 amongst many, many writers of a realist or a liberal left wing or even conservative and neoconservative persuasion. Indeed, the whole neoconservative project was based upon that premise, largely, a sense of America's overwhelming power. Then something even odder happened, <laughs> you might say. Uh, the unipolar 90s were followed by the terrible noughties. The decade from hell began. Uh, it began in Florida. Um, George W. Bush was then selected uh, by the Supreme Court. <laughs> 9-11 uh, followed a few months later, uh, the Iraq war, the war on terror, the 2008 financial crisis, which of course all economists predicted. Uh -huh. um, 
And then the United States lost the Ryder Cup in Wales. <laughs> and so on and uh, so forth. In other words, we move from a whole debate about America going down to another, another debate about America on its way up. And now, 10 years on, we're in a, what you might call a new mood of, of deep declinism. The empire has crashed and burned again. And we are now in another burst of declinism. And of course, this is part of the background for this whole debate about power shift. A sense that there is, as Arnie implied, an irresistible process going on here, both economic, political, soft power, and others, which means that America's position in the world um, is, is, in a sense, in decline, whether it's relative or otherwise. That's part of this whole argument about power shift. Two other things also happened in addition to this to add to this sense of Western angst. I'll be very quick on this. The two other things that happened at the same time as America's perceptions of American decline in the, nor in the noughties, the two other things, one to do with Europe and the other one, of course, was to do with China. Uh, take Europe and the EU as part of the debate about the West. The European Union vision began to fray badly. Uh, one thing after another, it seemed, happened. Firstly, we had the farce, and it was a farce, um, a farce in many languages, but it was a wonderful farce, of getting the Lisbon Treaty ratified, and then, not to mention who was then given the job of running European foreign policy, no, naming no names. Then the impact of the economic crisis. One country collapsed, called Iceland. Another one came down close to it, called Ireland, Spain, unemployment levels of 24%, and Greek rioters. The new image of Europe was not one of integration. The new image of Europe was one of disintegration. It was predicted that the euro was finished, and indeed that Europe was finished. Um, very interesting piece in the Financial Times recently. When you mention the word Europe, if you don't also mention the word crisis, you're in trouble. In other words, the two things go together. And of course, it was made worse in some circles, in the sense that the Europeans had for 15 or 20 years been talking the talk on developing a common foreign and security policy, European security and defense policy, but nothing really happened. Basically, you could find European foreign policy, some would argue I don't, in a room somewhere in Brussels in a building you could never find. That was European foreign policy, combined, of course, with this deep economic crisis as well. This again added to the sense of Western angst. The European moment uh, was over as well as that of the Americans. And then what also added to this, as I pointed out in more detail, and others in this room would know much more about, of course, was the emergence of China to the rank of second largest economy in the world. This, of course, was preceded by Goldman Sachs' prediction, <coughs> the famous one, uh, made indeed before the crash of 2007 and 2009, that the Chinese economy would indeed become the biggest at some point, we didn't quite know when, but 2050 seemed about as exact as they wanted to be. China would become the biggest economy in the world. Indeed, according to Martin Jakes, a, a fellow and visitor at uh, Ideas last year, and still closely associated with us, not only would the Chinese have the biggest economy in the world, actually, to use the title of Martin's book, China would actually be ruling the world, uh, taking the point even further. And in a recent study by a former American State Department official, who, by the way, worked under the Reagan administration, um, he, Stefan Halfer, he speaks rather gloomily of the emergence of a new Beijing consensus, replacing again the, the Washington consensus. So it's those three things taken together which form the backcloth to this kind of mood uh, within the West, within the United States, within Europe, about the power shift that is uh, occurring. And taking all three things together, US decline, relative or other time, otherwise, by the way, US declined for the third time. Uh, the irreversible crisis of the European Union, by the way, it's the fourth time. And the emergence of China, by the way, for the first time. Taking all those three things together, it led most pundits of different ideological persuasions to one overarching conclusion. The West itself was at a tipping point moment, even if, in fact, may have even gone over it. It had had its day. What had begun, and here I quote from Neil Ferguson, who will be here, so in fact, he's already here, I hope. Uh, if not in this room, at least in spirit. Uh, what had begun in the late 15th century, according to Neil, with the voyages of Vasco da Gama, here I'm being an historian, aren't you? I hope you're very impressed, uh, Henry the Navigator and Columbus to the New World in the 15th century, and which continued through the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution and the West's economic and military conquest of the rest, taking that long moment of domination, this long moment where the West had been the privileged driver of the world, this was now over. That's, in a sense, what many people are now arguing, from, say, Paul Kennedy, uh, and certainly people like Neil Ferguson, and many, many others. I'd almost say it's become the new truth. 
it's certainly become a new consensus position, which I think has been popularized by economists, some of whom are my best friends, Danny Quiet here, welcome, Benny, um, through to pundits and through to Goldman Sachs and many, many others. An era was coming to an end, I think this is the general thesis. The balance of power was altering irreversibly, a power transition was taking place, which would in time see the rise of a new axis of power, which we can call metaphorically but geographically the East. There's the thesis, there's the argument. I want to raise three questions about it, really. Um, I suppose which three arguments, partly of refutation, three arguments partly also of worry and concern. Firstly, on questions of power transition, this is a very problematic term, by the way. Sometimes when people are talking of transitions, they're talking really of economic shifts, and it doesn't necessarily mean political and military shifts. It's a complicated one, this term power transition. I know that when many economists say the shift is occurring, they're really talking economics and trade, they're not talking of political power, and they're not talking of military power, they're talking of one kind of shift. And I think that is a kind of problem with this term power shift anyway. But even if we accept there is such a power shift taking place, or a power transition as some have argued, then if history is any guide, it would be that we must be in for some very turbulent times. Um, I mean, let's put it rather broadly, hegemonic powers rarely decline gracefully, and rising powers rarely rise politely. Now, there's plenty of arguments against this I know today, in terms of the China-US relationship. Uh, they both have nuclear weapons, I think deterrence works, and I'm sure they do too, and I certainly hope they believe that. Uh, globalization gives enormous economic incentives to cooperation, there's no question about that. And China's own reading of the past is an agent in this structural relationship. China's own reading of the past, which I think has been pretty sophisticated, um, draws on this historical, this terrible historical transitions which have occurred in the past with other great powers rising and has concluded China has to rise in a different way in order to make sure that history just does not repeat itself, the so-called peaceful rise. So there's many counter-arguments to a crude power transition theory. The only thing is, it may still happen. And if it does happen, and if it is true, as some would argue it is, and I still have my doubts about that, then we may be in some very turbulent and dangerous times. And there's no point running away from that and simply kind of collapsing ourselves into some easy-going, what I call liberal arguments, that simply integration, economic cooperation, and all the rest of it will do the business. It may not. It may not. That's one, that's one question I just want to raise. We've got to kind of think that if there is some aspect of a power shift taking place, about which I do have my doubts, nonetheless, it, it's going to open up some pretty turbulent times. Um, but however, a more empirical argument, it's the old fashioned, to ask the question, is it true? I mean, my first point is, if it is true, we may be in for some turbulent times, but is it true? Are some people calling transition and the rise of the East before it has happened? Indeed, if I might use a phrase, isn't there life left in the old Western dog yet? Who wrote that? That must have been me. Isn't there life left in the old Western dog yet? The United States is still the dominant economic power, and by far and away the most powerful military power as well, and there's no indication for the foreseeable long-term future that this is going to change. Now, some people may want to say, and I know one or two people in this audience will say, it doesn't really matter that the United States spends half half of the world's military expenditures, has global alliances across the world, is the key security provider for Europe, Africa, the Middle East, to a peculiar kind of way of military, and into Asia. But I do think it matters. It is still the only global player, and I don't see anybody else taking its place for good or ill. And in spite of G.W. Bush, it also continues to deploy a fair amount of soft power too. Indeed, uh, whatever one says about China and this whole debate about soft power, I'm not too sure what China's soft power actually means. And if you're going to have power, it's got to combine not just the ability to produce or to export or to buy lots of products around the world, it's got to be combined with other kinds of forms of power, and I just don't see China has that to the same, anything like the same degree as the United States. Moreover, I am of a rather unfashionable opinion, which has not been uttered in this university for at least three years, uh, that the European Union is not quite dead yet. Uh, <laughs> Moreover, what is called transatlantia isn't quite so insignificant as some would have us think. I hate to go back to some boring facts, but economically, the transatlantic economic region contains the two biggest regional economies with a combined value of about $30 trillion. 
It is simply not as unimportant as one would sometimes get, listening to so much emphasis on the rise of the Pacific economy as if somehow or another the transatlantic economy was in a sense going, going literally quite down uh, the swan. I don't think it's quite so insignificant as some would have us think. Most foreign direct investment in the world still comes from this region. Most foreign direct investment in, in the world still comes from this region. The region is also united and has advantages in ways that other regions are not united. Uh, NATO plus democracy plus trust is a hell of a lot of whack in the world, is a hell of a lot of whack in the world. And I'm not sure that any other region in the world, taking the transatlantic region, any other region in the world, including the Pacific, which is a far more problematic notion, I think, Arne, has that. Whatever the short-term problems, in other words, they are what I call settled systems. They are settled systems. Uh, Spain can have a very high level of unemployment, and it doesn't, in a sense, bring the legitimacy of the system into question. Uh, Ireland can have all the economic problems in the world, but it doesn't bring the system, its legitimacy, into question. It seems that for China, you've got to have 10% growth each year, otherwise there's a legitimacy crisis, indeed, as this has always been admitted. And this would actually, therefore, indicate some fragility in this kind of growth model. I'm not actually talking it down. I'm simply saying I think that it has many more problems uh, than uh, has been suggested so far in this discussion and indeed by other people. The third and final point, I'll finish here, uh, Stryker. Um, it's, it's simply these terms West and East uh, I have problems with. Um, you know, being an old Cold War historian, an IR person like Arnie, obviously I love the West and I love the East in the old days. I knew where they were. I knew what the ideological dividing lines were, there's good guys, well, well I don't know where the good guys were in the Cold War, there you are, shows how confused I was. Um, but I knew, where, I knew where the ideological lines were. I mean, you know, there was a systemic, or, as Fred Harrell, our old friend, would say, you know, we knew, we knew where we were in the Cold War, at least Fred probably knew where he was in the Cold War, but we don't know where we are any longer. What do these terms mean now, I suppose? That's really where I kind of end my, my observation. What does it mean? when it is said that power is shifting away from something called the West, um, which we'll assume we know what it is, to somewhere known as the East. It's not at all clear in my mind. It's not at all clear what these, these terms actually mean. And I'll make three quick points here. Firstly, the geographical East, understood here to mean China, and also before that Japan, and before that South Korea, and we could include within that Taiwan. It's not just the China story after all. There are many, many other parts of this thing. Um, well, do I, dare, do I dare make the kind of crude dependency argument, but I'll make it here now, that the geographical East economically could not have risen without the West, and still it seems to me it remains quite highly dependent upon the West in many, many ways, foreign direct investment, for markets, and for many, many other things. So it isn't a separate entity standing out there as if it's some, something apart from what the West is. In a sense, there is a level of integration, both in terms of security and economics, and culture even which should not be you know, just pushed to one side. There are also, and this is a more contentious argument I know, I think there are many countries in the East who might be in Asia, including India, including South Korea, including Japan, as well as China. There are many countries in the East who might be in Asia, but really see themselves as more closely linked to the West than their immediate neighbors. I and mean, if we take a country like Japan, we take a country like South Korea, Taiwan, I know it's not an independent country, but it's still part of the region, still sees itself very closely tied to the West. Do they see themselves as part of a, what you might call an ideational, civilizational East? I'm not quite so sure. I'm not quite so sure about that at all. Certainly in security terms, that is not the case. Where many of the countries in the East look for their security still, however declining America may be, however relative that decline may be, they still look to the United States. For, for their key security relationship. They don't look to China, indeed, they often see China in a, in a threatening way. Rightly or wrongly, that's what they do. And the third point, and this gets back to the China question, Arnie, and it's, it's the dilemma for China's rise. And I think we've discussed and debated this before. It's my last point, really, Shrike, is this. If China were to become more assertive in ways that it has not been thus far very seriously, although we may be seeing the turn now on that, but that's another question. If China were to become far more assertive and act, if you like, like a normal great power, push its weight around, send gunboats up rivers, blackmail people, do all sorts of the, the things that great powers have normally done for 500 years, okay. The British did it forever after all. Um, if they were to become more assertive as leader uh, of the East, of this region that Arnie talked about, what would be the result? I think the unintended outcome of that would be a strengthening of the West. 
and a strengthening of the United States position within the East, within Asia, as many countries within the region, in a sense, knew who their friends were in a situation where they saw China pushing its weight around, which of course is one of the key reasons why China has fought, developed this theory of the peaceful rise precisely to obviate and get away from that problem. So I still remain to be convinced on the question of the power shift. I think things are changing without, without question, but that's stating the obvious. There are important economic transformations taking place, that is for sure. Whether it represents what we call tonight a power shift from west to east, I have my doubts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I guess we could have had, we could have put power shift, question mark, and then west, question mark, to east, yeah, question that mark. Would have, that would have been much better. But you, then the audience, well, the, audience <laughs> the audience then uh, is not as large as it is tonight. And thank you again all for coming. Um, given what we're talking about, I want to make a very quick uh, uh, announcement about something that's happening next week in case these two don't resolve the argument 100% uh, tonight. Dent of Leeds University. Um, I wanted to ask you both about something that was in the news today, and then we'll open it up to, to everybody else. Uh, China's trade surplus uh, grew in the, in, in the third quarter, and there's talk of President Obama uh, actually uh, imposing a, an import surcharge, uh, which would remind some of us of what President Nixon did against China, what, three decades ago? Um, four decades ago. Uh, and it, are we, you know, you've both talked about, about, about how things are changing or not changing, but is there, is there the chance, and Arnie, I'll let you go first, is there a chance of, of, of conflict of that type, currency wars, trade wars, or will it not get to that point? Well, I mean, Stryker, there, there certainly is. I mean, it also depends very much on what happens in U.S. politics um, up and beyond the midterms. I mean, this is a hot potato in terms of U.S. domestic politics more than, more than anything else. And uh, I can see the very unfortunate uh, development that we've had now, particularly over the past year, with American politicians overbidding themselves and being anti-China in terms of whatever the Chinese want to do, particularly in trade, in trade relations. But the real issue is not that. I mean, the real issue is that you know, the United States uh, is on the minus side with regard to its trade, its trade balance, with 92 different countries. This is not just about China. It is about the lack of productivity on the American side to go. You know, uh, one can go on about there being a need for an adjustment with regard to the Chinese currency. I think there's some very strong arguments in favor of that. Would that basically change the US economic position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? Well, only if the 92 other countries that at the time has a, has a, a surplus on their trade with the United States did the same thing. And it's very unlikely that they're actually going to do that. This is not how hegemony works in terms of international affairs, even if the United States has the political edge, and certainly has, as me quite rightly pointed out, the military edge. I think the difference between the two of us is this. I mean, there are lots of things that we agree on, but where we basically disagree is the effects that the decline of the United States in economic terms will have on its ability to carry out its foreign policy priorities over a reasonably long period of time. That's where the difference is. Yeah. I mean, I really do not see it as being possible, based on very sound historical precedent, that the United States, whatever it does politically, whatever it does militarily, will be capable of changing that situation over time. I mean, there's absolutely nothing in the immediate past that indicates that that will, that will be the case. And if that is going to be a continuing situation, then we know a great deal about what the future is going to look like. We don't know the details. Lots of blank spots to be filled in for the historians of the future. We're going to look back at this period, I think, with some glee when we get to the documents. So I can actually say <laughs> something serious that. about it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, but the main point is really this. I mean, Paul Kennedy had a good point, though he mistimed it and he overwrote, but he had a good point about imperial overstretch. 
Uh, his case was historical, as it, as it ought to be in the kind of books that he wrote, and he was more or less spot on with regard to that. He was terribly wrong about the future, about the projections of it, but in terms of noting that these cases of imperial overstretch cannot continue over a long period of time, I think Paul more or less got it right. Yeah, I, well, you raised you know, more than one question. First, I think, I think Paul was wrong on imperial overstretch. Uh, it, it may have been true for Portugal uh, or the Dutch in the 17th and 18th century in Spain or Britain. And I think it, 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 it's only true for him. Okay, okay. I just don't think it works for the United States. So I think Paul took a, a great historical argument and then applied it to the wrong country, uh, namely the United States. It would have applied to the Soviet Union in the 1980s, that's for sure. And he got, he got the Soviet Union dead right. I think he got the United States dead wrong. In fact, if you think there's imperial overstretch to the United States today, they spend about five, four or five percent max of their GNP on, on, on national security and the military. That is not overstretched by any stretch of the imagination. Sorry, in the Cold War they were running it at about 10, 12 percent, and Vietnam War was going up to 15 percent. You know, the United States gets a whacking in Iraq, and what does it do? It puts 100,000 troops into Afghanistan just to show how overstretched it is. I don't see it. Um, what does overstretch mean in terms of you know, the global reach of the United States? I mean, whatever the problems it's having with its allies, aren't you? And I accept that. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to try and write an article called Who Lost Turkey? The United States and the European <laughs> Union lost Turkey, politically speaking, not, not in terms of losing a country, you don't lose it. Um, uh, so, so to speak. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I still think that the capacities and abilities of the United States and its recuperation from positions of weakness should not be, should not be written off. That's all I'm really trying to say. I mean, as my, my, my early comments were not a kind of peon for American power. They were kind of say, look, we called American decline in the, in the 60s. We got it wrong. We called American decline in the 1970s. We got it wrong. You know, we called American decline in the 1980s. The Cold War came, came to an end. We called American unipolarity too much in the 1990s. Maybe we're bending the stick back a bit now in this new declinist phase. But I think we've just gone too far with this new, this new declinism. Uh, I still, and by the way, just quickly on the question of surpluses, I, I, I may be a rotten historian on it, and you're much better than I do. You're a much better historian than I am, well, at least for the purposes of this discussion. And we'll have a pint afterwards and we'll talk about it. I actually don't think, I think the, United, the fact that the United States can run deficits actually may be, an in, uh, ironically, a source of some strength. Because if it can run these levels of deficits with these 90-odd countries you're talking about, you know, what do the American people do? Well, they go home and they shop. Well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't see this as a kind of sign of deep decline. You know, I think, you know, the, the capacities of the United States to run huge surpluses, both on trade and on its budget, and continue in some way forward economically, I'm not sure that is necessary. The very fact it can run the size and scale of those surpluses, which everybody else deficits, which everybody else depends upon. China needs America to be in deficit. You know, others in the world need the United States to be in deficit, and it seems to me that's a function and a fundamental central role they play within, within the system. So I'm not sure that I would even see the deficits as a sign of a lack of productivity or non-competitiveness. It may ironically be a kind of sin, a, a signal of how, what capacity it has that it can run these levels of deficits so easily, really, and still continue to do so. No other country could do that. No other country could do that. And that does seem to be an important sign of what Susan Strange, a great political economist and IR person in this university, called structural power. And that's, I suppose, the difference between, I do think there's deep structural power in the United States still, and I still think those advantages still pertain. But, Mick, I mean, look, do you see, do you just want to walk around this, and then, and then, I'm sorry, you, you all, you can just go, yeah. Yeah. you know. On this, on this issue, yeah. I mean, one of the key, we are going to let them in. The key historical aspects is this, to me. And to what extent do we know of any other system in which it has been possible for one part of the world to be the producers and another part of the world to be the consumers? That everyone is putting up with that and being happy. Now, if the United States was willing to use extortion, I mean, exceptional blackmail, well. to a degree that it so far has not proven itself capable of, and I hope to God that it won't in the future, yeah. uh, using its military and to some extent its remaining political resources to achieve a continuation of that unequal balance, well, then it might be possible. But otherwise, based on historical precedent, certainly not. No, I just think, I, I, what, I, what I would say, Arnie, is I think the United States is a rather unique kind of great power. Period. Yeah, that's it. That's it. No, I said. All right, I'll stop. Period. Punto final. Oh, you know, see, see, speak see. Spanish. See, see. Oh. Uh, question. Over there. Wait, if yeah, you could. Uh, 
Um, there's been quite, a, sorry, there's been quite a lot of talk about um, some of the bad predictions that have been made in the past by clever people. Um, bearing that in mind, why should we believe any of you? Ali <laughs> <laughs> only gives me the hard questions to answer. You know the easy ones. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I accept your, I accept your, uh, I accept your scepticism. I mean, I think. I think the point to make here is we've got to treat all of these predictions with some degree of scepticism. Um, you know, and after all, international relations is not simply a question of structural determinants. All sorts of things can come in. Who said events, dear boy, events? You know, what about agency? What about the role of policy makers? What about the role of misperception? What about the role of unintended consequences? Did the Americans go into Iraq thinking that they'd have 5,000 dead later and 3 trillion war on their hands? And a massive loss of soft power? Clearly not. So, you know, I mean, that's the point. It is, it is an open historical process, this, and that's why all forms of prediction are to, be, are to be avoided. I will, however, make one. I don't think a power shift is taking place. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> is there a, another pointed question up, from up there? Thank uh, you. Yes, thank you. Um, as we speak like, about the uh, power shift from west to east, uh, but I forget, like, for example, today, uh, William Clark, the uh, Foreign Secretary of UK, is visiting Russia with official visit. Uh, what, what's your opinion about uh, Russia's place? Because in Russia it's always a question whether we stand with the West or with the East, especially now when uh, we build new pipelines in Russia towards uh, East uh, to shift uh, like energy supplies there from West. Uh, what's your opinion on this uh, matter? Like where should Russia stand and what do you think? Thank you. Okay. Looking straight at Barry Russo. Yeah. Who famously said. Who famously said, Russia has got a great deal of decline in it yet. <laughs> And it's not quite as simple as that. But look, I mean, I'm just back from Brazil. If you compare the other so-called BRICS, and it's a whole list, but I mean, if you, if you take the ones that have been growing, and the reason, by the way, why we should watch those is exactly the kind of historical parallel that I drew earlier on. If there is a power shift on the way, we're going to hear a lot more about countries like Indonesia, India, and Brazil because the freedom of maneuver will be much greater mm. than what it has been under the previous international system. Russia, in my view, is not among those. And the reason for that is very plain and very simple. The Russian economy is increasingly becoming dependent on raw material exports. Uh, countries that are dependent on raw material exports, such as we've seen in the Middle East for the past two generations, can do very well, but they do not do very well in power terms over time. And unless Russia basically redefines its approach in productivity terms, I think that's where the country is going to end up. I, I agree with that. Bar Barry's famous phrase was, I think, Russia had its, had its day and it, 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 it miffed it or something. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you know, I mean the, the, the end, the end, well, Barry's seen this, so I'll, I'll speak for him for a change. I mean, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, I mean, the, the events ever since uh, have produced a peculiar kind of hybrid system. It's, 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 it's got one shot, well, two shots. One's called oil, and the other one's called gas. It has other raw materials. And this, I think, is a very interesting contrast with China. And this is where talking about the rise of China does make sense. Talking about the rise of Russia within that doesn't make so much sense. I mean, not, and also the demographics of Russia look awful, particularly if you're male, working class. Your age potential is going down all the time. It's now down to about 58 and declining. That it seems to me, apart from the population going down, the particular demographics to show a pretty awful story. And it's not true for China. We've got a couple of questions over here. Uh, is there another mic or is it? Yeah. Sorry. <coughs> Maybe we'll take, uh, take, take, take a couple of them. Uh, and then the gentleman in the back after that. And then over here, we'll take three. Uh, it seems that uh, Mick Cox's thesis is the, an emperor's new clothes. My what? Your, your, your view on it is that this is uh, another case of emperor's new clothes. This, this okay. so-called rise in the East, whereas Professor Westat, it's an accident, possibly, that China has uh, reached right. these particular levels. And are we not seeing the economic consequences of the Cold War, as opposed to the political consequences with the end of history thesis, etc.? Okay. Okay. Good. Thanks. And back, to, right back there. Hi. Sorry, I'm late to this lecture. You may have covered this. Um, the world's wealth is already in the East, it's in the Middle East. Um, have you talked about the impact of OPEC on these ideas and where that will lead to in the future, in future alignments? Good, thank you. And then one 
right here, white shirt. Thank you, professors. Um, I know you'd like to look at the international aspect of things, but I'd like to hear your assessment of the internal composition of each of these states, the US and China, and how that plays into the way they would posit themselves externally. Because there are, I think, legitimate concerns with regard to the US about the dysfunctionality of, of Congress and so on and so on, and especially with China, and particularly pretended because of the Nobel Peace Prize and, and so on, so how this will affect the power shift. Good. Thank you. That's, that's a good question. We'll come, we'll come to you next. Um, so f first of all, uh, is what's happening ultimate consequence of the Cold War? No, I don't think it is. I mean, I think the, I think the Cold War to some extent uh, came out of the same kinds of forces that both Nick and I have been outlining here, although with different emphasis. Um, you know, I need mean, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, events that led up to it, in my view, are intimately connected to the reorientation of the global economy that took place in the two decades that led up to 1989 and 1981, uh, 1991, if you, uh, if you like. So in that sense, uh, you know, it all belongs within the same framework, although where Mick and I differ, I think, <laughs> curiously enough, is on the emphasis we now actually come to put on the end of the Cold War within the understanding of global <coughs> international affairs of the past 20 years. And that's what I should say. Yeah. But I do think it's actually true. Yeah. Mick emphasizes this more. I'll, I'll, come, yeah. I'll come on to that. I mean, I do think the end, I mean, I don't know about the Cold War overall. You can't read the whole of the present in terms of the, you know, a 40-year period of relationship called the Cold War. I mean, helpful. there's the 19th century, there's the Second World War, there's the First World War, all these things have had enormous impact, fundamental demographic and technological shifts. So just to put it down to one, two words, Cold War, therefore, that's where we are today. It's simplistic. But I do think the end of the Cold War does have some massive, massive explanatory power here in terms of what we're talking about. I mean, even in terms of China. I mean, after all, Arnie, you know, the crackdown at Tiananmen Square, about which you know a great deal, um, in 1989, in the June period of 1989, took place at exactly the same time as communism, official communism, was collapsing in Eastern Europe. It was the fear of Gorbachevism, if we can use that phrase, within China, which actually led to the crackdown. And you might even say one of the unintended consequences, one of the beauties of the ironies of history is that you know, the reconstitution of the state power as a response and reaction to the fear of the collapse of communism within China laid the political framework within which you could then go to your economic yep. modernization of the 1990s. And I think to that degree, the end of the Cold War does make a difference to what, and he was still left, obviously, within, within China, of a Chinese Communist Party, you know, so the largest we've ever known in history. Um, and that, again, is a legacy of a long history going right back to the 1920s, not just to the Cold War, but it is part of a legacy of what we've called communism, and I think that's still part of the story. Well, I agree with that. Mm. I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, I think it's just a question, if you look at this over a long durée, over a long yeah. period of time, what is going actually to stand out as the most significant? Yeah. I mean, one of the issues to me, and this goes to the question about internal choices, which from an historical point of view really makes sense to us now, is exactly what Vic was pointing out, the survival of the Chinese Communist Party in, mm. in power. And I do think you're right in saying that that has something to do with lessons drawn mm. from how the Cold War ended, and specifically the, the collapse of the Soviet Union <laughs> itself. One should be very careful with overstating it. Though. Going back to the question that was first raised, how can we know anything about this? Hey, some of the things that happened during the 1990s in China were, if not accidental, at least there were not issues that easily could have been bred out of 1989. I mean, the increased emphasis on reform, the party's realization, as I've said elsewhere, fairly controversially, that in order to make up for what they did in June of 1989, the party came to emphasize middle class consumption. Uh, you know, the ability of actually delivering to the very same people whose sons and daughters they've been shooting at in June of 1989. I do think that played a role. Uh, how significant it is, we won't know until we actually can get to policy documents and, and, and look at it. Now, on the internal choices issue, both countries, as the uh, question said, face some very difficult choices. I think they're very different in terms of the choices that they have to make. I think for the United States, for this administration, particularly in its second period, two things will be particularly important. One is to manage the relationship to American allies around the world, because Mick is entirely right in saying 
particularly for the East Asian region, but also on a global scale, that this is what will determine much of the outcome in the short term of America's ability to project its power, whatever it is, uh, on, a, on a global scale. And the second one is whether the United States are willing to make some of the hard choices to try to turn around their economic fortunes, particularly in relative terms. And relative here does make sense. Because if you look at the United States in and by itself, if you compare the United States of today to the United States of you know, 1970 or 1980, the United States is not doing all that badly. Even though we have inequality has, has increased, social mobility is less than what it used to be. Relatively speaking, based on its own history, there is no disaster in the making. It's relative. It's when you look at Brazil today, it's when you look at China today, you know, that, that it really that it really stands out. And the turnaround for that is where I'm really asking my my most profound questions. Is any imaginable US political leadership? capable of undertaking that dramatic turnaround that is needed? And if not this administration? Well, that, that I think goes to really this, the, the other half of your question, which is the state of the American political system and its capacity to get anything done. And you wanted to look at it really from the ground from up, the internal. Mm -hmm. from the internal. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's, it, from the ground up. Arnie, did you do that? Was that you did that? That was you, wasn't it? Up from the ground it's down. rising! You it's rising. It's rising! Ideas is rising peacefully. Notice everybody's <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that too. Who did that? You did that. I'll wait for this to finish. Thank you very much for that. Look, I mean, maybe it's just, I've just come out of three months of watching West Wing. And, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've done the world record on Twice that last on, 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 on what, yeah, the last desk code, I know. Um, I mean, you do, I mean, you know, I'm not using this as my empirical foundation, but it is a pretty damn good series, I have to say. Um, really good. Really. That's good, good enough. However, the point is this, look, whatever the disrepairs that there are within the American political system, I, I, I call it a settled, I still call it a settled system. Um, you know, it, it, it can have, it can, it can produce nutcases like the Tea Party, it can make Sarah Palin a lot of money, it can welcome Tony Blair as a hero. It, it's, got, it's got California in one part, Texas in another, and New Hampshire in another. Um, it's clearly going through a, a, a sense of its own angst. There's no question. You know, I talk to many of my, my best friends. My, my, some of my best friends are American. You know, I go there quite a lot. And, you know, you do get this sense. I mean, there was a Pew... Some of the people sitting there. Uh, well, absolutely <laughs> striking. Um, the Pew did a, a survey recently. It was an interesting survey. I don't always believe it. <coughs> public opinion polls unless they reinforce what I already believe um, and know to be true. But the, one of these opinion polls said that the most optimistic people in the world today, according to Pew, are, the, are people in China. And some of the least optimistic are those in the United States. So only 24% Americans are optimistic. Well, that's misery on a huge scale because America is based on optimism and the future and a, and a, sense, and a sense of the future. So, I, you know, everybody knows that the unemployment levels, the structural unemployment, all these difficulties. And also this, this you know, these ridiculous things, you know, 45% of all Republicans think that Obama was a Muslim. They, they don't think he's an American. Darwin was probably a communist, you know. Um, you know, there are some very, very strange phenomena within the United States. However, I always say the however then, you got to, I mean, I wouldn't say you've got to love the place, but it, it, it's, it's got a dynamism, it's got a pluralism. It produces the Facebooks of this world. It produces the technology of this world. It produces an enormous amount of real culture, which ordinary people around the world want to look at, actually, as well. As opposed to all these boring British films made, you know, about declining aristocrats in the 18th century. We read all this rubbish. Jane Austen, one more time, you know, give, you know, give me a good American Western at any time. So I, I just think there's a vitality about this place. You know, it's peculiar history, it's, Im it's immigrant character. Um, it, it, it's, it's got a vibrancy, which I think, it, it, you know, we shouldn't simply undermine. The, comparing the kinds of problems it has with the kinds of transitional problems that China fa is facing at the moment. You know, you know, you know if, you were, if I was a Chinese or American leader, I think I'd like to be American leader at the moment, facing the sorts of problems it's facing, as opposed to the terrific problems that China's facing at this current moment. It's a silly comparison, but you get my point, yeah? Got it. Go. Ahead. You got, got it. it. You got it. Now we we ran roughshod over the second question, okay. which was about the Middle East and oh, I don't know anything about Middle East. and OPEC and what. And should we not factor them into 
all of these discussions about the future and I Okay. I know at least as little as Mick does about the Middle East, but let me just have a have a go at it. I saw the problem is connected up to the same point that both of us made about Russia. Um, you know, being uh, raw material raw material which can only take you that far uh, in the way this international system, and I'm pretty sure the coming one as well, is constituted. Um, the Middle East has for the past generation shown the strengths and the weaknesses of, of being in that position. Um, they are dependent on the economy elsewhere working. Uh, if the economy elsewhere does not work, you can see what happens in Dubai and elsewhere. They're also very much dependent on the power constellation, and that, that's the issue that I'm particularly interested in with regard to the Middle East now. Um, you know, Kuwait is a very rich country. Uh, in terms of the conflict with Iraq in the early 90s, there was not very much that they could put up, except through their link as an oil producer to the United States. And this is the big question, I think, for the future. The degree to which there will be a rivalry between key economic poles in the global uh, system with regard to the oil and gas riches of the Middle East, or the, the wider Middle East region. That's one of the very, very big questions. For the time being, and this actually sustains one of the points that Mick made earlier on, and I think I sort of halfway agree with it, and mm. certainly look at it from this perspective, China has been extremely careful with being seen as challenging the United States over direct access to oil resources in the Middle East. And I think this will continue for quite some time, for the very good reason that this is seen as an American vital interest, something you do not want to mess around with, mm. as long as the United States is still by far the predominant uh, military power. Now, come another decade, China's needs will be rising. How they play that one may very well be the first signal outside of the world on how they're going to behave globally. Mm. You wanted to make one. No, just brief. Point. Okay, very brief point on this. Look, I mean, everybody, if you look, going back to my public opinion polls, you know, one part of the world where the United States is seriously disliked, except in the case of Israel, um, is the Middle East. Um, you know, the, the, it has literally no soft power at all in large parts of the Middle East, except I'm told amongst a large section of the Iranian middle class who quietly actually do quite like the United States. Um, the, the, the reality is that the only single major power in the region, Arnie, and here would you agree, and it does say something about my argument about love it or hate it, not like its policies or admire its policies, it is the only single major player within that region uh, uh, as an external player. You know, everybody, you know, the phone number you have to ring is somewhere in Washington, and it's somewhere in that White House, in that West Wing, you know. That's who you've got to ring up. You don't bother to ring up Brussels, you don't really bother to ring up anybody else, that's who you ring up. Now, you might have to do it because you don't want to, you might go to a peace process you don't really want to go to, sit next to Palestinians or Israelis you don't really want to sit next to, talk about things you think are going to fail anyway, but nonetheless, the United States is still there. It is that, and I really can't see anybody else playing that role ever. Now, that may be bad or good. I wish the European Union had more of a voice there, but they don't seem to have that. And it does seem to have kind of partly reinforced my overall argument. The Middle East, after all, does produce 6% of the world's oil, and it is the United States which is the key guarantor of stability and security, and sometimes creating quite a lot of insecurity and instability, but it is the United States which is there at the centre of that. And China is, of course, very happy to see it. Absolutely. And that the United States, in terms, in terms of its current involvement yes. in the Middle East, you, take whatever course it wants you to You keep it, yeah. We have a question here, and Barry, Barry and, no, oh, you were, it's, it's not an auction, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is, we're going to vote at the end of this, by the way. First of all, I just wanted to say I'm surprised how easily you dismissed Russia uh, from this. Uh, I didn't actually answer your question. But maybe uh, you it. Uh, I mean, uh, probably Professor Westerdes, historian, knows that Russia actually uh, was a great power when the Britain was was in times of British Empire and also in the Cold War, and. Uh, Russia probably was such easily dismissed also after the Crimean War and then re-emerged after the Second World War, sustaining the most of material and human losses, and used the same uh, probably um, methods of assessing that as you did in Middle East, that Russia is just the exporter of the raw materials. Russia also has a huge, the biggest territory and probably one of the still uh, 
military force and uh, also nuclear power. Uh, the other thing is about China. I just wanted to say uh, challenge as the West is probably that China is obviously producing a lot and GDP is increasing, but China has a lot of internal problems hidden so far. And as more GDP rises, as more capital is in China, the probably question will be whether uh, communist regime that is currently in China is suitable to uh, govern it. And whether if China is becoming uh, challenged by democracy from inside, that it might actually get into internal conflict which decline its power. And my question is, why is the uh, uh, debate here about superpower, why can't we just live in a balance of power when obviously American power is, and Western power is declining and uh, East is rising? Uh, so why can't just be a balance of power? Okay, uh, can you pass the mic over to Barrett? Just pass it along there to the man in white. Uh, thank you. What I actually said about Russia was that it was down and out and not coming back, if you want to quote me correctly. Sorry, uh, very close. And I'm sticking with that. Um, but what I, what I want to say is, uh, at the risk of seeming um, uncharacteristically kind to my colleagues and ideas, I, I think they're both right. What, what, I, what I think is wrong here is the premise of the, of, of the debate between them, which is false. Um, so it isn't a question about a, a power shift from west to east. That kind of locks you into this uh, a paradigm built on the Cold War, where somebody has to win and somebody has to lose and somebody has to be dominant. It locks you into a paradigm of declining superpower, rising superpower. Are we going to be in a unipolar world or a bipolar world? I think all of these questions are wrong um, in, in the sense that those who have acquired power, and let's leave Russia out of this for the time being, generally hang on to it. So Mick is entirely right that the US isn't going away. It's going to be powerful for generations to come. Um, and Arna is entirely right that China is rising and, and becoming more powerful in the world. Uh, and the same could be argued about all kinds of other places as well. And even those places that are poor and grotty and not very powerful are still powerful enough not to be occupied. Uh, Afghanistan, right? So what's happening here is not a power shift in the sense of from one center of power to another center of power, but a general diffusion of power in the system, which means that nobody is going to dominate the planet. Right? I think uh, Arna was coming closer to this, uh, closest to this when talking about regions, a regionalization of the world. China is certainly getting powerful in its region and wants to be. The US is becoming less powerful except in its region. Your Europe may be inconsequential worldwide, but nobody's challenging it in its region, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're looking at, it seems to me, is not a power shift from west to east. There's certainly a relative decline of the west from the extraordinary position it reached uh, in, the, in the 19th century, but you, you're not going to find any superpowers anymore. You're going to find a kind of decentered world order in which power is diffused in all kinds of ways and in all kinds of places, of which China may be one of the leading, but certainly not the only example. Good, thanks. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we have the word myth, myth on yeah. the magazine. Yeah, that's good myth. Uh, and by the way, if you do have a chance, uh, there are two other contributors to the cover story of this magazine, and uh, the arguments are, are even more nuanced there than, uh, than, than we, can, we can do tonight, so, so do have a look. Uh, what would you like to say? To we want to emphasize the bait here, don't we? Um, very quickly on this, um, Russia, I mean, you should never count out Russia. I think that's absolutely right. What I'm saying now is not to count Russia out. What I'm saying is that Russia needs to fundamentally change its approach to the rest of the world if it is going to come back into the position of power that it's traditionally held, first with regard to Europe and East Asia, and then for a relatively short period globally. It's not enough today to be a first-class raw material producing country. It needs to have much more to build on than that. The academic institutions are in decline. The basic uh, build-up of the social, uh, of social networks, of, of anything that feeds into production <coughs> still seems to me to be, to be in decline. Can Russia change its approach? Most definitely, it can. 
Uh, but that will depend on making some very tough choices, which the current leadership under Putin have not been willing to do. They've not been willing to do that for good reasons, because of what they're dependent on. But it still needs the kind of political courage that Deng Xiaoping did show in the late 1970s, so basically saying we need to live in a different way from what we do today. Um, China in terms of stability, yeah, links on well to the, to the question of, uh, of, of Deng's choices and developments in, in Russia. Uh, China lacks the fifth modernization. It lacks a regime that is seen, broadly speaking, within its population as being legitimate beyond the enormous increase in terms of wealth uh, that the country has seen. It needs a more balanced approach in terms of uh, the inequality that has developed within China. But first and foremost, it needs a more open political system. And as I said earlier on, and I cannot underline this strongly enough, this is China's number one development challenge. Because if the current regime in China does not become seen as more representative, not only will it increase the potential for conflict, whatever kind of transition we are actually looking at, I'm pretty sure we're looking at some kind of transition, um, and the more difficult it will be to pull the essential aspects of popular support along with the leadership when they have to make some very hard decisions about China's place in the world. Brings me to Barry's support. Why not both? I mean, why not the diffusion of power? I, to quite some extent, I, I, I agree with you on that in the short term, as I indicated in, in, uh, in what I said initially. I do think that China will, for good or bad, uh, play the leading role in challenging the present construct <coughs> with regard to US power. Uh, first within its, within its region, and then probably in, in a global sense, irrespective of what happens within China itself. Um, the reasons for that I outlined already. I mean, it's China relative to the rest of the world, not just relative to, to, to the United States, and its position within what is by far the most dynamic region of growth uh, within the world as such. Where we will end up, of course, depends on the choices that are made. I mean, out of China could come. It's entirely possible. A political leadership will say, we've had enough of this. We're not of the, you know, the, the dominant hegemonic nonsense. We want to emphasize economic growth. We want to emphasize the links that we have to the rest of the world in terms of production. I don't think it's very likely, but is it possible? Yes, most definitely. Uh, and there are, of course, very strong voices in China, <coughs> inside and outside the Communist Party, who is arguing for that in the world. But just like there are forces who are arguing that the rest of the world is inimical to China, and that China needs to build its military and strategic power in order to confront you know, a, an inimical world. We're coming up to our time. Uh, does anybody have a burning question? Okay, there's one here. We'll do. Uh, okay, let's do. We'll do three. Are they? Can we do those three questions yeah. and then? I pick up. I pick up on Barry's question because I want to come back on that. Okay. So I disagree. You won't be surprised to hear that. Yes. Although the power shift problem is a little bit question mark in today's debate, but for me, the South Korea, the power shift problem is very critical one because we live in the, between the China and the United States. Uh, for example, the China is the number one trade partner for the South Korea, and the United States is, is the oldest military uh, alliance with the South Korea. And in dealing with the South Korean leadership thinking, the South Koreans uh, discovered that the improved the Chinese influence on the East Asia and the Korean Peninsula. So if the power shift in the, is in the question mark, then what kinds of the strategies for the South Korea to seek to uh, maintain its uh, national interest or something like that? OK, yeah. good. We'll get to that. Uh, and then the, these two gentlemen here, and then that will have to be it. Yeah. Um, it's just a quick question. Do you think that nationalism, especially regarding China following the you know, 100 years of humiliation, 1950s, and nowadays with the, in, in the use of the internet, and as we've seen recently, the tensions between China and Japan, how will this affect China's relationship with the region and with the United States? Good, right, right here. Uh, uh, Yes, just a quick question as well. As opposed to uh, U.S. two main rivals in the 20th century, uh, uh, Nazi Germany and Russia, 
uh, China has a population advantage and a fairly big one. Uh, to what extent does this uh, uh, does this matter? Good. Thank you very much. So South Korea. Uh, well, let me just get, let me. Oh, well, you want to? Yeah, I, I, okay. I, I mean, on Russia. Look, I mean, the question wasn't writing Russia off. I mean, but I think you know, the broad point that was made has been repeated here. It's not writing Russia off or saying it's insignificant, but it's a good deal less significant than it was 20 years ago uh, by, by a mile since 1989. That seems to be an incontrovertible point. It has no ideological mission, which it once had, which gave it global reach. And I still think it has a real problem defining a positive role in the world as to what it actually is. That's the, I mean, if you want a serious argument on that, we can have that one. So it's not a question of writing it off or dismissing it in any kind of uh, arrogant way. On the, on the question of Barry's point, though, I just want to come back on that, Barry, because I think you know what you argue is kind of theoretically sophisticated but I don't think policymakers are necessarily as theoretically sophisticated as Professor Buzan. Um, by which I, by which I mean, I still think a lot of policymakers do look at the world, Barry, in precisely the kind of terms that this debate is cast in. Now, this may be wrong, it may be not good, we perhaps shouldn't have this kind of debate because we're only encouraging policymakers to think in these old-fashioned ways, but I think that's the way they do think. And that's, I suppose, where we're casting the debate. I think you may be right in some, some larger question, but I'm not sure this is the way the policymakers think in those terms. Now, the way policymakers think can be quite complex. We don't want to oversimplify the policymaking and analytical approach, but either in China or, or in the United States. But I, if I might be broadly crude and say that I think overwhelmingly they tend to think in sort of strict, not strictly, but broadly speaking, loosely, realist ways. And I do think they do tend to think, therefore, that the world is you know, composed of powers. The more you have of it, the better. And the less of it you have, who wants to be a loser? Uh, particularly on the American side. And, I, and, and, and that's, that's really my, my, more of my point, as much as it is, is it objectively true? This, I think, is how policymakers do think about this world. And act on those perceptions. And I think there are two perceptions at the moment which I think are of deep concern for, for future stability. And this is why I'm a bit less sanguine than you are, I think you're, you're more optimistic about this, Craig, than I am. I think on the one side, I think there are growing American fears on their side that they are beginning to lose, as has been argued here. I don't think it's true, but I do think they think that they are losing, and they think that China is certainly rising, and I think there's very strong inclinations on the American side, not amongst all American policymakers, to think about containment of China, to prevent it rising. This will in turn create a security dilemma, the Chinese themselves, I think, by the way, and I overgeneralize, but that's what I've got to do in a short period of time, I think the Chinese may themselves be misreading the situation now in certain ways that may, may make them think they've got more power than they really have, and they may, after the 2008 financial crisis, have even more power than they think they have, and therefore they've got more leverage in the situation, and are doing things, and I don't want to go into the rights and wrongs, it's doing things at the moment which are actually generating an increasing security dilemma. And I think that is the real worry at the moment. And, and that actually does bring us then back to the South Korean question in, in, in an indirect way, because what actually happened over North Korea and South Korea, again, the details, we don't have to detain us here, but we do know how the Chinese responded to the, to the sinking of the South Korean ship, which was clearly done by the North Koreans, and, and everybody knows that, and the Chinese obviously know that as well. Why, therefore, did they not state that openly? Now, we know why they didn't do it, but what was the consequence, therefore, of a Ch the Chinese reaction, to, and this is my point at the very end of what I said in my early remarks, what was the, what was the reaction to, to what, what the Chinese did? It was to lose, firstly, China any degree, or well, a large degree of soft power and public opinion it may have ever had in South Korea. We saw that straight away. And what did the Americans then do? They came and had an immediate and military uh, operation and a, and a new, you know, so it brought America back into the region. And, and, it, and again, it, it kind of brings me to my ultimate point there. That, uh, if China acts in certain ways which don't constrain itself, if it acts in ways which are perceived to be threatening, they may not be threatening, but perceived to be threatening, then I think it raises huge problems for China's position within the region. In other words, South Korea thinks itself as part of the East, maybe. In Asia, obviously so, but still a very close ally of the United States, which confronts a very large China. On demographics, I'm, I, I once read Malthus, and I always thought it was nonsense. Um, many, many years back, and I kind of don't buy into arguments that, you know, if you have lots of people, it's a problem, or you have lots of people, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm told, I read one set of things, that there are too many old people in the world, which from my point of view is a very bad idea, 
you know, uh, or there's too many young people in the world, or there's too many middle-aged people in the world. You know, I, I, I've never seen a consistent argument on demography. I know demography matters, but I've never seen a, a consistent argument on what, what any of this adds up to being as a systemic, explanatory variable, maybe because I hated Malthus so much that I've been stuck with this kind of anti-demographic anti kinds of arguments. Well, you can have the last word on this. Topic. As always. Yeah. <laughs> if you come up to ideas, you'll, you'll first find Meg's office, and then you'll find mine a little bit further along. So that everyone who comes to visit will have to go to, uh, to the end of the room in order to, uh, in order to see me. I can get the last word. Now, um, population. I mean, yeah, population matters, but not always in, in, in the ways that uh, historians, particularly economic historians, have taught. It's what your population does that really matters. Uh, and that will be the case in China as well. Uh, China faces a challenge on this in terms of its demographic development, particularly because of the one child policy, which in many ways has failed, and certainly is failing at the moment. Uh, you get fewer, uh, fewer and fewer. Uh, children coming out of urban environments in the cities, out of families with highly educated parents. And that wouldn't have been a problem if you'd had more social mobility within China. But social mobility within China over the past few decades had actually been quite limited, which is one of the country's biggest problems. So, you know, having a big population is good, but it's only if you can bring them in to a productive use of their collective talents, as it were. Now, on nationalism, Korean and Chinese. In China's recent mishandling of the situation on the Korean Peninsula, there are some signs of the arrogance of power, or indeed the arrogance of economic success, um, or even of uh, assumed position within the region. Um, uh, I go to Beijing quite a lot, and I would meet with people, should be unnamed, with uh, a fair amount of responsibility for China's uh, foreign policy decision making. Who will be tearing their hair out with regard to the North Korean allies and say, you know, what kind of great power are we when we have one formal ally in the whole world, and that's this decrepit dictatorship right next to us? If we can't handle that one, what can we handle internationally? It's good that they're asking themselves that kind of questions, but then they blunder into the kind of situation that has come, come, come up now. And it is entirely right in mean, a significant loss of the only place where China's soft power really played a role, and that was in, in, in South Korea. Now, what's interesting now is that that hasn't made the South Koreans, particularly young people in South Korea, love the Americans more. They, they protest both against the, the joint exercise and against uh, Chinese policy uh, on North Korea. Some, sometimes, believe it or not, it's the very same people who, who, who argue for these kinds of positions. But I think China needs to look very hard at the situation with regard to the Korean Peninsula and, and, and carry out a, 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 a significant change in terms of its policy. Mm. South Korea is incredibly important to China. Getting this one wrong mm. uh, in, in, in the slightly longer run, and much of China's potential for building the kind of relationships inside its own region that it wants and needs will, will be gone for, for, for quite a while. So these kinds of things do matter. Nationalism within China itself. Another very problematic aspect of China's rise. Um, I think sometimes abroad, Chinese nationalism is exaggerated. Uh, there is much more self-doubt within China, much more doubt with regard to China's abilities and the Chinese people's abilities in the longer run, uh, unfairly in my view, towards their own people, than what often comes out in public. What I have seen, though, and which worries me, and where well, I think that only a opening up of the political system will um, point in, in a different direction, is a narrowing down of what it means to be Chinese within China itself. And that worries me a great deal. And it's something that's happened over the past half generation, roughly at the same time as the economic growth has taken place. Being Chinese used to be, when I first started coming to China more than 30 years ago, a cultural definition first and foremost. Uh, now it's getting increasingly ethnic. If you want to operate on a global stage as a great power, that's exactly the wrong direction to move in. A lot of Chinese see that. But, you know, to end up on a, on a note that I think Nick and I do uh, agree on to, to quite some extent, China is not ready in these terms to take on a position of global power yet. It, the leadership knows it. I think the population knows it as well. The question is, as the economic realities on a global scale continue to change, 
how will China then domestically respond to that? Not just in terms of high politics, but also in terms of popular attitudes. Good. Well, thank you very much, both uh, Mick Cox, Arnie Westad, and all of you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you.